Hello and welcome back. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana, and you are watching Marksman TV. Today I have another analysis of the most recent video put out by Federal CCI Spear Remington brand ammunition by President Jason Vanderbrick. I did a video like this on the re uh, former video that they had put out as well as a video by Hornady. You guys seem to have enjoyed it. Uh, anyway, I'm going to go ahead and do an analysis on that as well as touch on some of the questions and comments I saw in the last video covering a similar topic. So anyway, if that sounds interesting to you, please stick around, that's coming up now. All right, before getting too much into the weeds on this, there was one common thread or question I was seeing in the last analysis video that I did on the former videos put out by Federal and Hornady on the ammunition situation. And, and that was, what authority do I have to talk about situations or, or issues like this with ammunition or to analyze or criticize, whichever way you wanna look at it, the presidents of these large corporations. I don't really think we need to have any type of particular credentials to talk about social or political issues. Otherwise, we just end up with a echo chamber of people with really expensive degrees being the only ones allowed to talk about or comment on these sorts of things. With that being said, I do have a very expensive degree from uh, the Quinlan School of Business from Loyola University in Chicago. I have a BBA with a focus in marketing. Uh, again, I've been working for about the better part of a decade within the firearm industry, operating my own business. Prior to that, I worked in the airline industry and briefly worked in the, uh, in the financial reporting sector. Uh, again, I don't really think any of that really matters. Everybody just has their own opinions, but for those people who are asking, that's my background in business. So with that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump into this. Hi everyone, I'm Jason Vanderbrink, president of CCI Federal Spear and Remington Ammunition. Our last video we did, had been viewed over 2 million times so far. So our, our gratitude and appreciation goes to all of our loyal customers who had viewed it, had shared it with your friends. So you can understand the shortage of ammunition as we see it as a major manufacturer. So I think what we wanted to do since we received over 13,000 comments was to answer some of those questions and concerns and be transparent with our customer base Okay, so right away the video takes a much different tone and approach as, as compared to the first video. Uh, in the first video, of course, he came out, the lighting was a lot darker, uh, his tone and mood seemed a lot different than it does right now, and I think he caught a lot of criticism for that, you know, rightfully so. When you're putting out a video, you don't want to come out, especially in the press release sort of thing, to come out defeated, upset. Uh, and irritated specifically at your customer base, no matter who they are and what they think. I think that the criticism was taken well here and they put out a new video with a much more uplifting tone and saying, hey, thank you for the continued support watching the last video. This video, instead of focusing on the negative, we're gonna focus on the questions that we received from you guys, the customers, and what we can do to address those questions to create a better sense of transparency between you and the brand. And I think that that's exactly what's going on here. And so he's going to address the most pressing questions that he received from his first so, video. So, I think it's appropriate and we're going to attempt to answer some of those questions right now. One that first came up and lots of different questions on it, what are we doing for the health of our workforce? Certainly since the pandemic hit, uh, health of our workers is paramount to our company. That, that health of our workforce is number one. So we're strictly adhering to the CDC guidelines. Work from home for all the office personnel has been in place for several, several months. We are temperature checking. We are requiring masks. We are requiring social distancing. We are restricting the amount of people that come to our factories. So we have a very, very good track record of doing proactive initiatives to keep our workforce very healthy and their families healthy as well. Okay, so the first pressing question he says, or the one of the first questions he's noticed is questions revolving around the safety of the manufacturing and what protocols they are taking in terms of the virus going on right now. I do find it hard to believe that that is one of the most pre pressing questions that he has been seeing. The most pressing question I have been seeing is where the hell is the ammunition? Um, I find that in this industry specifically, there are more people who are less concerned about the virus than there are people who are overly concerned about the virus. I think he's probably using this as an opportunity to share the technological uh, implementations they put in place, the costs that might be associated with it uh, for the, the attention that they're paying to the safety of their workforce. Now, I mentioned this in the last video, it is good to pay attention to the safety of your employees and your customers. You have to really, when you're operating a corporation to keep customers employee, I'm sorry, to keep employee morale up, you really need to operate to the lowest common denominator. Even if you have one, one or two employees who are scared to death of what's going on, you have to build your safety infrastructure around those concerns 
you catch everybody else in the net who are less concerned and you overall have a more positive work environment for all of your employees. That's the way you really have to operate your company when it comes to safety. Also to eliminate any type of risk of opening yourself up to litigation by being careless or reckless with your employees or your customers when they're coming to work every day. I think that this is more of a political nod saying, hey, these are the things we're doing in, in around COVID and all that stuff. And he's using this Q&A style video to sort of put that information out there to people who might not necessarily be asking for it, but just to say, hey, it's there. Also, it's a two-pronged approach here and to talking about maybe limitations that are coming into production of ammunition because, hey, we're putting all this emphasis on COVID, uh, you know, safety around our plant, of course, that's going to reduce our workforce, our work hours, the amount of people allowed on the floor at the time, at a single time, or I'm sorry, uh, resources that could have gone to ammunition are now going into temperature checking machines and stuff like that, just to be another sort of back, uh, backing or an explanation to what is going on with supply. But, you know, I'm lukewarm on this question. It, it I think it was already addressed in the first video. It did not need to be addressed again. We understand you are taking precautions on COVID. Good on you. Uh, let's keep watching. Another question that came up, which I get asked every day, rightfully so, is where is all the hunting ammo this year? I don't think I've heard that question nearly enough is where the hell is all the nine millimeter ammunition in 556, <laughs> which is kind of funny. So again, this, this Q&A type of video, I think, is to address the most pressing questions that he's been receiving. I, again, I think the question on really the top of everybody's mind, if we can take my store and my YouTube channel as a small sample of what people are probably thinking and asking, that's the number one question I'm hearing is, where's the nine, where's the 5.56? Five, five, it's those two calibers that people want. Some people talking about 22, but people want, you know, 45, 40. People want to get out with their defensive firearms, whether they're ARs or Glocks or MPs or XDs. I don't know of too many people who are freaking out because, you know, when you go hunting, you're not necessarily blasting 150 rounds at Bambi. You might be taking out, you know, I, I don't know in a, in a standard hunting trip, how many rounds most people shoot, hopefully not more than 10 or 15. I understand people need to go out prior to their trip and sight in their rifle if it's a new scope, a new rifle or anything like that. Um, but anyway, you know, if we're talking about a day out, you know, in, in the woods hunting, uh, it can't be that much ammunition that's being expended. Um, again, we'll we'll go on with this, but 30 out six and 243 and 270, I have virtually nobody coming in looking for it. But we'll keep going. So I gotta say, without giving specific numbers, Federal's been around for 99 years. We've made more hunting ammunition this year in than we have in the 99 years of our company. Certainly, that wasn't enough. Um, we understand that. But it's safe to say we put out a lot more hunting ammo in 2020 than we have in 2019 and any other previous year of our 99 year history. I believe that and I don't think it's just the hunting crowd. I think when people are unable to find 5.56, five, I mean, I had people buying uh, M1As and uh, Century C308s for home defense because that's all they could find and those shoot 308, which would be considered a, a hunting round, I guess. I, I would say in the hunting round realm of things, 308 is probably the most sought after I've seen people. I have been out of stock at 30-06 and 243 and 65 Creedmoor. Yes, I do occasionally get people coming in asking for it, maybe once every two or three days. I get asked about nine millimeter probably 40, 50 times a day. I mean, easily. Um, if you look in the comment section on this video and the previous video they put out, it's pretty clear that you know people are really more concerned with that. And that's kind of the ammunition question I would like to see addressed because that's the ammunition everybody wants. I mean, people are selling a box of nine millimeter for 120 rounds right now. We'll talk about price gouging you know, in a second and price fixing and price inflation and all that. Um, so interesting that we're focusing on hunting ammunition here, uh, but we'll keep going. I think it's a good thing with the social distancing that hunting brings, we saw an influx of new hunters this year, which is exactly what our industry needs. It's that there is not a better social distancing activity than hunting. Again, social distancing, we're back at COVID again. Uh, interesting. I don't, I, I have not seen armies of people trying to get out in social distance by hunting. I, I have seen armies of people looking for self-defense ammunition because of rioting. Uh, so interesting, but we'll keep going. Or if you do it because you like the organic meat, whatever the reason, we need to ensure that hunting ammunition is available going forward because we don't want to lose all of the new hunters that the industry has gained, whether it be us or one of our competitors. Frankly, 
We love what we see as far as the demographic and the new entrance into the market. And hunting ammunition is just, there. it's just a, the lifeblood of all of our companies. So what he talks about here hunting wise with, you know, new people getting in, new demographics getting into the market. I think that I, I am seeing that as well, not necessarily just with hunting, but with firearms in general. And it is great, like I said, we saw from the last video, seven to 10 million new first time buyers. A lot of those uh, first time buyers have been women. I mean, when the phone rings, the amount of women that are on the phone looking for ammo and firearms is great because when I first opened uh, in uh, seven years ago, you know, we didn't really, I mean, predominantly my customer base was mostly men. That's mostly men who have been into this marketplace. Now, especially in the last year, the amount of women who have been coming in, picking up transfers, uh, buying, trying to buy ammunition, buying firearms is staggering. It's huge. The Vista Outdoor conference call that we did the, the analysis on six months ago, that was one of the biggest demographics that they had seen as well was a rise in female shooters, which is great. Um, there's also uh, the, you know predominantly white shooters as well. You have non-white people. I, I don't know what the correct politically correct terminology is. Um, black, Asian, Hispanic, you know, all demographics are raising at staggering rates right now. And that is phenomenal. And that's great. And that's exactly what he's saying here, you know, and, and hunting, but across all genres of, of firearm purchasing, that's exactly what I'm seeing as well. And other manufacturers have been reporting also. So let's keep going. So bear with us, stick with us. Trust me that we are doing everything we can to fulfill that market. But to see the growth that we saw in hunting market in such a short amount of time, no company could react that fast. It takes raw materials, it takes direct labor. Um, so we certainly were proactive in a lot of that, um, but at the same time, increasing capacity that quick just certainly wasn't uh, possible. But rest assured, we made a lot more hunting ammo in 2020 than we have in the 99 year history of our company. So, uh, okay, let's get into capacity. And this, this is something I did want to touch on. The level of demand that we are seeing here is unprecedented. It really is. Now, in previous times like 2013 and there's been ammo shortages when uh, President Obama was first elected, yes, there were big uh, bumps in demand. Those were really minuscule as compared to what we're seeing now. Not only has there been the political issue, there's been the COVID issue, there's been the rioting issues. A lot of things have compounded into a supply shortage unlike anything we have really ever seen. Now, a lot of people have said in the comment section that the ammo manufacturers should have known. They should have produced more ammunition. They should have created a surplus quantity of ammunition, stored it in separate warehouses. So in the event that this happened again, they would be ready to supply uh, you know, the market. It is their duty as a Second Amendment oriented corporation to do that. It's really, really difficult and you have to understand to create that excess supply, they would have had to invest in excess raw material. They would have had to pay an excess in workforce. They would have had to have built, uh, purchased and maintained an excess machinery, excess floor space. That's really, really expensive to have to do all of that to build up supply for a demand that might come down the road. It's much more economical to create a level of inventory or, or a level of supply to, to meet the demand that currently exists. Then when there are unpredicted or predicted booms in demand, there are other things that you can do to control or at least mitigate a lot of the supply shortage that your company has uh, to stay afloat. And that's gonna be a more ideal outcome for a company than to potentially you know, have a demand boost and then spend years building up for it. Also, when they put out all that in, uh, ammunition that they've been spending all those years manufacturing and, and putting in storage, that's gonna cost their daily average price of their ammunition to go up, um, even under periods of normal demand, because of course they have to pay, they have to offset all of that. These are still corporations. I know in the Second Amendment community, we do get very patriotic about the supply that should be, or the things that people should be doing with their company that other people aren't paying for. Uh, but when, but it is still a corporation. They still need to do things that make business sense and financial sense, whether or not we like it. Yes, sometimes then we end in these situations. In order to control the demand, one way to do it if you don't have the supply is to fix the pricing or to elevate the pricing. That has happened to some extent here on the supply issue. We know that because Federal sells ammunition directly on their website and the pricing is elevated. It's not 10 to $12 a box of ammunition anymore. On the retail level, online websites are selling 9mm ammunition for upwards of $100. 
the uh, way that we can combat that increase in pricing is basically twofold. One is new people can enter the market and create more ammunition. You have more supply, there's more to go around, the pricing will naturally fall. The second way to do that is to stop buying the ammunition at the expense of pricing. As long as people are willing to pay it, it doesn't matter who's selling it at that price, the market will always find a way to sell it at that price. What I mean by that is, is if Federal were to sell it for $12 a box online, what people are gonna do is buy it and then go put it on GunBroker and then, you know, well, let's back up. They put it for $12 on their website. People are gonna buy it. It's gonna quickly go out of stock. Then people are gonna go to GunBroker, put it up on GunBroker, sell it there, and the pricing is gonna explode at hundreds of dollars. So whether you're paying Federal the $100, whether you're paying cheaper than Dirt the $100, whether you're paying Joe Blow, who picked it up at Bass Pro Shop yesterday, $100, you're still paying $100 because that's what the market is willing to pay. Once the market, i.e. consumers, you guys and me, once we stop as a whole paying those crazy prices, the pricing will come back down. But the way that you know free markets work, the way that they are established, the way that capitalism works, this is how it works. You can't get mad at it. This is These are the rules. This is the game we play when it comes to this sort of thing. I don't like it as much, any much more than you guys. When I get ammunition, I absolutely am not selling 9mm for $100 a box. I'm trying to keep it as low as I can. And for a long time, I was able to keep it at 15. My pricing went up from my wholesaler to $30 a box. I had to sell it at about, I think I was at $33.99. Uh, but I'm only getting you know 15 to 20 boxes at a time when I get it. When I sell it at that pricing, even if I limit it to one or two boxes a customer, it goes out the door in less than a day. What are some of those people potentially doing? Maybe selling it for $100 online, or hopefully they're putting it in their gun and shooting it and practicing. But that's just kind of where we are on that. So it gets, you know, you have to understand it's very easy to get patriotic with other businesses' money. No, it's not reasonable to or to expect a company to put millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars into infrastructure that they don't need for periods of years at a time. Okay, that's just a really poor business decision and it's not gonna happen. Anyway, let's keep going. Another very important question that's on a lot of people's mind is what are we doing with primers? The answer is very, very simple on primers. As the ammunition demand continues to surge, the primer market suffers because the primer capacity, instead of going to the commercial market so reloaders can use our primers, that capacity is now going to feed our internal needs to produce all of the Remington CCI Federal Spear ammunition. So if the market and ammunition is very hot, as it is today, historically, the primer market suffers because all manufacturers use primer capacity to service their needs in their own factories before selling the primers off as excess. So another question that comes out of this, which is right, a right question, is why don't we just increase capacity? I, I've seen lots of comments, so why don't you just build another factory? Well, we gotta go back for the last three years Prior to March, when the uh, surge started, there was a lot of excess capacity into the market. So with ex excess capacity, it didn't make any sense to expand capacity even more. So we want to utilize our factories at capacity as much as we can. And if we made a, an investment today, it's several years before we're going to see more capacity come to the market. But we can't simply just build a new factory or simply just expand. It doesn't happen that fast. Okay, the first thing he addressed, and these are actually two real questions I'm seeing a ton of, is the, the primers. It ob absolutely makes sense. Primers are a critical component of making ammunition. These companies make ammunition. Their ammunition is in high demand. They're going to put those primers in the ammunition and sell the ammunition rather than just selling the components of the bullets themselves for the limited market of reloaders, which is small compared to the market of people who are looking to purchase already made, ready to shoot ammunition. The next thing, again, he talked about was capacity, scaling up capacity. Again, this leads into what I was just saying. You have to remember, yes, there have been periods of boom in demand, and it's you can't structure your entire business just for those small periods. And I know one to two to three years is not a small period to most people, but you know the last big ammo explosion we saw was in 2013. We're seeing it again in 2020, so there's been about a seven-year gap there. The time in between, other than the, the, the height of it in 2013 and the height of it again in 2020, now into 2021. The time in between that was relatively sparse. We had come off the heels of the presidential election with President, uh, 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 President Trump, and with that came a massive drop in demand. The supply, the capacity that they had for the President Obama era, which was a much higher level of demand, we saw that as retailers 
and of course manufacturers in the marketplace that we had an overabundance of supply and it was killing a lot of people. A lot of businesses were dropping like flies. If you guys remember that period of time, 2016, 2017, because demand dropped by a third. What happened if back in the Obama era, they built another factory? What if they put a whole bunch of more money into machines? They hired, you know, 600 more people. And then President Trump wins and then the demand completely crumbles. That puts you in an opposite position, which is equally as bad. You have the position that we're in now, which is a tremendous amount of demand, but very little supply compared to that demand. That is a better position to be in strategically than a period of way over exertion of material and capacity and very little demand for any of it. Because you can always, if you have a baseline overhead, you can always meet those expenses. You can meet the worker expenses. You can meet your what you have to pay on your uh, you know, depreciation on your assets, on your factory costs and all of that. You can meet all of that if your baseline has already been figured out and you're already selling the, the product you need to to cover that expense. Everything else is excess and profit. The other way though, is if you have really high overhead and really low demand, that's that's what puts you out of business. Um, so strategically, you, you definitely want to hedge your bets against a market that is potentially going to explode and make you a lot of money versus the safe bet, which is to structure your business in a way where you know at all times you can meet your overhead requirements and the cash you need to get, basically keep your company running. And then anything you can squeeze out beyond that, it's gravy. It's just all bottom line. It's all, you know, just, just excess cash flow, which is great for your business as well. So, you know, we don't want to, what he's saying is we don't want to invest a tremendous amount of money in all this stuff to just be left hanging with it when demand goes back to normal. The other thing he touched on as well was the time it takes to build a factory or train new personnel. The question is, is it, you know, had they uh, decided to increase their capacity back a year ago when this all happened, and it, remember hindsight is 2020 on these types of decisions, it, they may have been looking at one to two years to have their capacity completely brought up to the standards where they could actually meet the demand in the current marketplace. But that's such a big risk not knowing what the demand is going to be like. Now we know nearly a year later the demand is still strong, but there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, one was the outcome of the election, which we didn't know what was going to be back in March. The other was all the rioting and everything, which we didn't know was going to happen back in March. So, you know, they had to know strategically, again, what is likely going to be the outcome based on historic events that have happened, and when will we expect demand to turn back to normal? And they don't want demand to turn back to normal at the time they're cutting the ribbon on their brand new factory that they just spent potentially billions of dollars on. You know, you see what I mean? So. In theory, it's great to say, yeah, let's go ahead and boost capacity so I can get all my ammunition now. And then you have the bleeding carcass of this overextended corporation that's left behind with all this capacity with no demand to pay for it. And that's, I think, you know, the issue that they're running into here. The other thing is the theme people have been asking about ammunition. You know, if they're pumping out so much ammunition, where is it? Again, if you're not in line at, you know, Cabela's or Dick's Sporting Goods or and not Dick's Sporting Goods, but, uh, you know, Bass Pro Shop at, you know, 6 a.m. on a Friday when they get to their deliveries or whatever, uh, if you're just casually walking in on a Wednesday afternoon hoping to find ammunition, there are people that are literally, literally lining up at these places. Uh, this happened in 2013 with the shortage after Sandy Hook as well. I remember because I was one of those people, you know, trying to get any ammunition that I could. People would say back then that ammunition wasn't going to return and you know, people are, you know, secret contracts and it's all going overseas and all this. It's the same things that are being said today. The supply did return when the demand calmed down. Again, namely, it took a big political event. It took President Donald Trump getting elected and his, at the time, very pro stance on the Second Amendment that caused people to calm down and overnight, not only did demand come, or supply, I'm sorry, come back, but demand totally plummeted, again, leaving with an overextended market that had been used to very strong demand for a period of, well, actually close to eight years. So there's ebbs and flows in these things. It's a very volatile market, and it's really hard to predict and play these sorts of things out. So anyway, let's just keep moving. So bear with us. There's nothing going on on the primer shortages. It is strictly going to feed Federal Remington CCI Spear factories first. So hopefully that helps answer some of the questions that we got from the last video. I think going forward, we'll do more of these and certainly we have a fun one coming up with what we're doing at Remington. But I just wanted to say thank you for all of the business. And again, as we are supporting American manufacturing jobs, whether it be the thousands of people, thousands of employees that we employ in Idaho, Arkansas, Minnesota, or the other US manufacturers, 
When you go to buy ammunition, just remember, American manufacturing is the heart of this country. We have to support American manufacturing where we can. And we, again, thank you for using our products. Thank you for our confidence. And on behalf of the thousands of our employees, thank you. So good note to, to end on. I totally agree. American manufacturing, American owned businesses are businesses worth supporting, especially now with all the sort of exchanging of you know global commerce that's going on right now. There are foreign uh, ammunition manufacturers, absolutely. If you find that ammunition, buy it, go use it, shoot it, enjoy it. If you're okay spending $100 on a box of ammunition, that's totally your right within the marketplace to do that. That's just what the ammunition is selling for right now. Um, again, I think that this is a symptom of trying to keep manufacturing at a level that is sustainable over a period of time, not just periods of high demand or periods of demand drought, okay? I think that that is all that is going on. I know that there is ammunition out there. I hear from customers all the time who luck into cases of ammunition. Uh, they say that, you know, they go into a store that gets pallets of ammunition and it's gone in three hours. Again, that's why I think not a lot of people are seeing it available. Also, one other thing is since March of 2020, people have been placing back orders on ammunition and pre-orders of ammunition. So a lot of these online retailers are trying to fulfill those orders as well before, <coughs> excuse me, before excess, am excess ammunition ends up available on their site for normal retail. Again, there's been a period of people putting in orders for large uh, quantities of ammunition, so there's just a lot of people to try and supply. To quantify the amount of people out there trying to buy ammunition is an impossible thing to do. Um, even with the pallets and pallets of ammunition that are sitting behind them in this, uh, you know, at the end of this video, uh, that pales in comparison to the amount of people out there. Again, I have a very small sampling, my small store in Indiana and my relatively small YouTube channel. If that's any indication for the tremendous amount of people, I mean, I'm just one person and I've probably had to answer this question thousands and thousands and thousands of times. And I'm sure other retailers of ammo and firearms have been in the same position. There is a just unbelievable amount of people out there buying ammunition right now. That is just something that's gonna be really hard to maintain. So I know a lot of that was rambly and redundant and I'll just leave it off there, guys. If you have any questions, leave those down below, any comments as well. Again, this is all just my opinion. If you have your own opinions, wanna challenge my opinions, I'm more than happy to entertain that and talk about it in the comment section. I'm gonna leave you guys off there. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV and I will see you next time.